Hello and welcome back to APIs You Won't Hate. My name is Mike Bifulco. I'm one of the co-hosts of APIs You Won't Hate. And I'm sitting down today for a chat with the uh, founder of a really interesting uh, dev tools company who's uh, building something that I think a lot of uh, consumers of and builders of APIs can uh, really relate to. Um, I'm lucky to get to sit down today and chat with uh, Robin Bildner from Nango.dev. Uh, Robin, thanks so much for joining me today. How are you doing? Hi, Mike. Great to be here. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to have you. Um, why don't we start here? Tell me a little bit about yourself and sort of your background uh, leading up to Nango and uh, what, what got you into this mess to begin with, and then we can talk about the product. Awesome. Sounds good. Yeah. So I started coding when I was 12, I think like sort of, you know, got out of curiosity and trying to start up when I was 16, I think I've been sort of in the, you know, startup and B2B SaaS space in a way ever since. I was, you know, writing iOS apps for a few years, like uh, got like built a little agency around that and got bored with like the repetitiveness and, and then you wanted to build more product stuff. So right out of college, I started a, a company called Abrios, together with a couple of friends. And it was basically like a fleet management software for B2B, a B2B SaaS for fleet management. And as part of this, we had to build a ton of integrations. So kind of, I would say like, you know, a third maybe of the product in one sense or the other was like kind of integrations basically. And so we had like about 50 different integrations or, or different providers that we had integrated with. And it took up, you know, sort of a good chunk, I would say like 15 to 20% of our engineering resources for a good chunk of the life of the company. And I was the head of product there and I was thought like, that's crazy, you know, that we're spending this much time on sort of like building and maintaining what was essentially kind of data pipelines. And at the same time, my CEO, you know, my co-founder and CEO, he was very annoyed that we were not, did not have more integrations because he felt like, you know, a large chunk of deal sort of would not go through because we were missing integrations. And that's kind of how I realized that like, Integrations are just like, you know, super critical function inside of the company, a super critical function inside of the product that, you know, is kind of like never done. And it's super annoying to maintain. It's actually like takes a lot more infrastructure than, than you first expect. And so when I left that company, I you know, knew I wanted to start something again. And I kept looking for ideas for about six months and on, on this integration idea. And I realized that it's actually still an, an unsolved problem for a large chunk of the market out there. And that's kind of how we started Nango. I feel like you very casually mentioned that you joined a startup when you were 16. Is that true? That's, that's, yeah, you've been in the game since then? Yeah, I mean, it was a side job, right? You know, I was in high school at that point in time. Yeah. I kind of started working for a few hours a week next to school for, for, for the startup. And like, yeah, you know, didn't, I didn't pay me a whole lot of money, but like, you know, it was a great learning experience for me. And uh, yeah, like a, a year or so in, you know, the, the iPhone came out. It was like the first iPhone you could program for. Right? It was like I think the iPhone 3G or 3S or something like that. And I asked them, like, you know, could, like, could you like maybe buy me an iPhone as part of like sort of my salary and birthday present in one? And that's how I, you know, got to have an iPhone as 17 year old. And I never could have afforded this myself. And that got me into sort of like iOS development, which led to me doing some client contract work and um, did that for a few years at about, you know, 20, 25 apps in the app store. Was making decent money for kind of like a high school student's, you know, side project. But I just realized it's like not... I guess the repetitiveness of, of the way I was doing it was not something that I really appreciated. It was a good lesson sort of in, in business and, and, and some finance, but like yeah, I realized that I think like what I really enjoyed at that startup was like building product, having an impact on people's lives and being able to grow something from zero to, to one and beyond. And I think that like really, I guess it's like kind of the thread that goes through the rest of my you know career at this point is like sort of starting things and, and building things from scratch. Yeah. Wow. It certainly sounds like it. Okay. So uh, now we fast forward to the future, you know, years later, I suppose, and you're building Nango. Can you tell me uh, what's the elevator pitch for Nango now and, and how did you get there? Like, what's the story uh, from, uh, you know, managing the B2B SaaS that you're working on and building integrations there to your sort of current state? Yeah. I mean, at Nango, we really build a single API for all your integrations. And I know that's, you know, there's a bunch of companies out there, I think, that are claiming to, to give you that. I think the thing that makes us different is that we, instead of trying to pre-build as many different integrations as possible, we've sort of built a really great developer experience to build integrations. And that, you know, has a, a bunch of interesting trade-offs. Like it gives you a lot more flexibility on the kind of integration and control over integration. So you can really build exactly the integration that your customers need and, and never be constrained by the platform. But at the same time, we aim to give you a lot of the sort of you know, ship integrations fast and, and low maintenance aspects that you get from sort of like more pre-built solutions. And I think the secret sauce is sort of in like how we've chosen the abstractions and how we've made those trade-offs to give you that flexibility while still providing a lot of support in the areas where it truly matters and, and you're not having to like sort of learn every API um, from heart. 
me and my co-founder started on this about, you know, two years ago, almost. We, we basically, you know, I think like so many, you know, teams, I guess we started with like sort of an idea and like started talking to, like, so I saw this problem right at my last company and, and we started just talking to other, you know, engineering teams and like, so how do you guys build integrations, right? It's like, you know, it's 2022. Um, it was at that point in time and, and like, you know, sort of unified API is like kind of like, you know, second, you know, coming with like, you know, the rise of Merge and, and Finch and some of those other solutions. And so we talked to a lot of people and what we saw is just really like the vast majority was still like building in-house and like uh, was usually aware of sort of the unified API solutions, but it just didn't really feel like it fit, you know, with what they were doing. And on the other hand, you have like these embedded IPAS solutions that are more kind of like low code, no code tools, similar to say here for kind of embedded integrations. But I'd also like, I think to a lot of developers just didn't feel like the right way forward. Like they didn't want to like sort of have, you know, end up writing code sort of in a low code, no code tool to like run API requests in something that's like kind of a visual workflow builder when really what we're, they were building, right? It's like sort of a key feature of the product and the key infrastructure, really. Yeah, and so we, we started iterating on like, how could we solve that problem? And honestly, I think it took us almost a year to sort of find the right approach and find the right angle. And there have been some, you know, interesting detours on, uh, along the way, but, you know, I'll save those for another conversation. <laughs> I think that's fair, yeah. I really like that your focus is on the sort of developer experience uh, and, and building towards that, um, especially in a marketplace like you mentioned, where there's, competition, uh, you have to find something to differentiate on. And um, I, I'm wondering, like, how did you land on that strategy uh, in, in terms of uh, your sort of place in the marketplace of uh, unified API tools? Yeah, it's a good question. I think we, we were following what we were hearing from developers. And then we tried different approaches sort of to solve the problem. And so I like, I mentioned that like, it took us, you know, almost a year to find, I think the right entry point. I think it's like, it speaks to how complex the problem is and I think like how, you know, nuanced sort of the solution has to be to be truly helpful. So I think the part that we had to get right was like sort of find the right level of abstraction. Like we knew from the beginning that like what people truly want is control, right? Like they don't want to be constrained by what they can build with their integrations. They like need full control over the product experience. This is a key feature that customers are asking for. Like if an enterprise customer wants and wants a specific thing and a specific Salesforce integration, like you can't be like, you know, I'm using this framework that makes things really easy for me, but unfortunately that means, you know, I can't like, you know, give you what you want in this integration, right? Like this is not really an option. And so I think what we had to really nail is like sort of these abstractions. And I think we started with, like eventually we figured out what we were going to do is like sort of start really small. And so we ended up focusing on just for about a hundred APIs. It was kind of like, or 30 APIs. I think it was like the first version of this product. Wow. And so we, we took sort of everything that we had built and like threw everything out that was not OAuth and just focused on making OAuth a really smooth and really simple experience. That I think sort of got us, you know, the first, you know, foothold and in, in foot in the door with, 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 a, with a number of, you know, potential users. And then from there, we kind of went back and we're starting to look at all the other things you have to do, like sort of two-way data syncs and webhook handling and, you know, data caching and, and deduplication and, and, and all those sorts of things that were sort of like added on back in once we figured out sort of what the core, I guess, interaction loop was and, and like how we could really start untangling the problem for people so that even with a sort of minimalist version, the product could already do things that were meaningfully better than if they were to build in-house. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's really interesting to me too that like, I feel like OAuth is one of those problems that every time someone's saddled with building an OAuth integration, it's kind of like, oh, you've got to go learn a bunch of stuff that is going to vary depending right. on who wrote the thing, whose product you're integrating with and like, sort of how mature their their side of things is. Uh, and that is that is pretty high on the list of things that I would love for someone to take out of my lap forever. Uh, and maybe OAuth 3 is the solution to that longer right. term, but definitely for now, that's that's a really good place to get a foot. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, there's OAuth 2.1 coming up, right? At least, or it has been coming up for two years or something. And I think it's like, but I think the hard part with, all, with OAuth is like, you know, what you're alluding to, I think is the problem that we see in all parts of APIs, right? It's like, there's sort of semi-standards and like sort of conventions on how you do things. And that can give you the illusion of things being similar when actually they're not always similar and they behave differently in different edge cases. And I think that's kind of like what we're trying to, to do with a platform or what we've done with OAuth is like sort of we pre-implemented OAuth 450 APIs, right? And still today, every time we implement the new OAuth version, there's like a bunch of like little quirks that we, that we find that we sort of have to like, you know, work around. What we see is like sort of this repeatability in those quirks. And so 
with the platform that we're building, really, we hope to sort of give you the right tools so that it's kind of like, you know, you just need to find the right screwdriver inside of Nango and then like it will fit nicely and the screw will actually turn. But if you've got to like build the screwdriver every time from scratch, it's just very annoying. Yeah, I can understand that. And so at this point, you uh, have you gone past just OAuth? Are you integrating other parts of the API as well? Oh, yeah, for sure. So today we're a full like, you know, solution for, for two-way data syncs, right? Like that's what most of our customers use us for these days. So if you wanted to say like, you know, integrate with a CRM, you want to maybe create a contact there. But then if you want to create a contact, you typically have to know which contacts already exist. So we'd first like sort of sync out all the contacts. So you can have a version of those inside of your own, you know, products database. And that's, you know, really useful because now you, you can do much, you know, quicker search. You can enrich the contacts sort of from the CRM with other data from your system. And then we let you have this full like sort of two-way sync experience. And then also webhooks. So we support like sort of webhooks on, on both sides of the equation. And so you can have like real-time data. Those two-way data things can also be real-time basically with the external API. Um, and, and we have like, you know, sort of support for that for 150 different APIs. And I think the, the part that we do different is, as I said, you know, we sort of not, it's not like we're not going to go give you the full pre-built, like how to create a contact in every CRM that we support. We have some, you know, templates that are pre-built so that you can get started quickly. But then the goal is really that we have the building blocks so you can have exactly the way to create a contact in the CRM that fits your app. And so you have full flexibility on the business logic and how exactly you integrate with the app. Uh, I can see the the case to be made for like now you're sort of learning one pattern for any of the APIs that you're integrating with. Uh, it's a, a lot more bolstered and hardened than having to go deal with everyone under the sun's APIs. Um, yeah, for, for context, I live in a world where some of my job at some point is going to be uh, integrating with APIs from companies that would love for you to think that they're tech companies that are really just like wearing uh, the death mask of a te <laughs> tech company that came before them. Um, and a lot of them are sort of right. in like the home improvement industry in the U.S. generally, where it's like they may may have a very shiny logo mm -hmm. and a website that you can get to, but under the covers, it's it's pretty messy. And um, dealing with those things, integrating with those APIs is one of those things that creates lots of headaches for reasons that feel really innocuous at first. Oh, I can imagine. Uh, but like we're, we've run into things up and down the mm -hmm. stack from like a, a um, post request that deletes a record to, uh, you know, undocumented functionality and stuff like that. Um, having someone who's at least had experience mm -hmm. with those things and sort of uh, mapped and abstracted that out of the way is, is a really interesting proposition. Um, with that being said, I'm curious, can you describe like, what would you call, who's your target audience right now? Who are the people who are sort of most interested in uh, Nango? Yeah, I think it's a good question. I think it's, you know, definitely B2, like we're exclusively doing this for sort of like, you know, integrations inside of B2B SaaS, right? So all our customers are, are B2B SaaS companies where integrations are a core part of their product typically. So, you know, with the, with the rise of AI use cases, you know, obviously almost any AI product, right, like needs to interact with other, you know, sort of services around it. And so, you know, that's a, a big sort of use case. But then I think another one is, is really sort of like any B2B SaaS that, you know, lives inside of an ecosystem. So like almost no product today kind of is its own island, right? Like everybody, like your customers basically always have just like, you know, bundle of other SaaS products that they use around you and they expect you to sort of seamlessly integrate their workflows. So I think popular categories for us are sort of like, you know, CRMs, accounting systems, also ticketing systems are pretty popular, productivity, but then also like sort of, you know, documentation, like kind of Notion, Confluence, file storage systems like Google Drive. We support 28, you know, different categories of APIs and we see that that's really needed because like the way you basically build an integration and the way you integrate with those other APIs always depends heavily on your product. Like yeah. it's really, you know, goes to the core of like the value you provide to your customers. And that is going to shape like what kind of data you need from the external system, how the interaction should be with the external system and what the experience should be for the end customer. And so it's typically, I think like often people will actually sort of like, you know, use some part of CRMs, but then also, I don't know, have some you know, task tracking systems, which at first you wouldn't think like sort of go together in the same you know, product, but like it, it, it gets like pretty diverse. Sure. I can imagine that without a doubt. It's, it's really interesting to me. And something I feel like we never really talk about is well, companies that build developer tools and integration tools for APIs. Um, there, there had to be a moment for you that was sort of like a chicken and an egg problem of you've built an interesting tool. How do you get people to come use it and try it? Uh, what is that like? How do you market to right. the people who are now your end users and your, your customers? How do you find those people? Yeah, I think they ended up find as of today they mostly find us. And I think when initially we we kind of sort of went to them. So um 
I think when with the first versions, basically we 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 posted it in you know a couple of Slack communities where they're like sort of for for other startups and and then the entrepreneurs. We wrote some blog posts about our journey on like you know how what we were doing and how we were building, like what we were learning. Those got some traction, and we wrote actually a blog post that was. Um, got a lot of attention, but like almost, you know, seemed to like to, to get the wrong audience in a way. Like we wrote a blog post about OAuth and like, you know, why OAuth is still hard in 2023. And this was published in that year. And it, you know, we came, was very successful, I think, in, in the sense of like, you know, it really resonated with a lot of people. What we realized is like almost everybody who read it apparently used OAuth, but used it mostly in the authentication sort of context of like logging into an app. And um, so it didn't quite give us, you know, the users that we were hoping we would be getting out of it. But I think it did help sort of, you know, put the the name on the on, on, on the map. I think it's just honestly early on, it's just like being creative and, and like sort of, you know, I think the way we're thinking about it is kinda of like if if even just ten percent of what we do like ends up, you know, having some effect, that's great. So like we just gotta do a lot and, and try different things and, and, and see what works. Um yeah, and I think another interesting aspect to this is like sort of how we you know, to, and Nango is fully open source. I think we never even talked about this so far, but like, you know, all the code is on, on GitHub, right? Like you can, you can inspect everything. And that I think also helped sort of with, you know, early interest in adoption. But there's a funny backstory to this where we initially built like sort of a data syncing product first. And that like sort of didn't really resonate as much, but we needed OAuth as part of the data syncing product to like basically, you know, be able to offer access tokens. Um, and when we were looking into that, there was this company called Bearer that have built an OAuth library called Pisley. That was essentially a tool for, for doing OAuth with a lot of different APIs. And they had built this a couple of years earlier, had sort of like launched it and, and then unfortunately didn't have the resources to maintain it. So by the time we found Pisley, it was like, you know, a week or so after they had officially like archived the repository wow. into maintenance mode on GitHub. And um, it had like, you know, a dozen or so users, I guess, and, and a couple hundred stars. And so we reached out to them and asked like, hey, you know, this Pisley thing, like is actually really what we've been thinking about building for Nango. Like, you know, would you be okay if we like, you know, maybe take this over and maintain it? And, and they were like, you know, super graceful and, you know, sort of gave us the, 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 the repo. And that I think has been a boost for us in terms of visibility, but also I hope that, you know, we could give something back to the community. And to this day, actually, we, we keep the OAuth part entirely free, open source and, and, and like, you know, free for everybody to use, like in, in part for the spirit of like, you know, uh, making sure that Pisley can live on its original mission and, and a thank you for the gift of sort of free code that we were allowed to take over from them. Yeah, that's the dream of open source from day one. You were adding value to something that had previously existed. And, and in all honesty, rescuing something from uh, the dreaded archived state is a pretty impressive, like the timing is pretty uh, um, uh, serendipitous there. That's a, that's a really... I got super lucky. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And I'm really glad also that, you know, the team had the, you know, really like, was was so welcoming to us taking this right. over. Like, you know, they they could have been like, no, this is something that we've built and, you know, like, but I think they really left the spirit of open source and, and made sure that, you know, the project can succeed no matter how that what what form that sure. takes. Sure. Yeah, that's that's really incredible. So I'm I'm interested in hearing a little bit about um teams that are building APIs right now, uh, that may be interested in becoming something that Nango integrates with. Um what does that look like? I mean, I think we integrate with all the public APIs that are out there. So Nango is built to work with any, you know, public API that exists. I think the teams that are building public APIs have a lot of respect for them because I think it's a really hard task because you have, you know, such, if I look at like the use cases, right, that like people come towards you and are like, look, here's what I want to build on top of your API and that like, you know, ranges so widely. I think it's really hard to do a good job. I think it's like the best you can do is do your best job in a way and, and, and like, you know, make sure that, you know, what you publish is accurate. I guess it's the usual stuff, right? Like if the docs are up to date, that's amazing. Like you make everybody's life easier. I think one thing that we see is really helpful is like if there's API key off and off, that usually seems to be like sort of a, a best of breed situation. Like off is great for like, you know, integrating when with third party APIs, API key makes it very easy for your customers to still use the API without going through a lot of hassle. Yeah. And then beyond that, I think it's, you know, it, like how you design the API, I guess, like, you know, really comes down to your business and what you think is right for your company. And I think like most teams that we see there do a good job at this because they know their product really well. So I think that's, you know, good that they're doing that. Tell me about then what what amount of your integrating with public facing APIs is automated? Like, are you ingesting open API specs, uh, or are you uh, building these integrations sort of one at a time for each of the the public APIs that your team is coming across? 
Yeah, that's a good question. So we sort of have like two layers you can think of in, in Nango. One is like sort of the access layer to the API. So this is really about like implementing the authentication method, like OAuth or API key. Along with that, we also do things like, you know, figuring out what are the other like rate limits that we should respect. So like, you know, we, we pre-configure those in the platform. Then you're like, how should the retry handling work? So that's this pagination that's sort of globally applied to the API. All of these things we sort of like pre-configure in Nango. And then the second part is basically like the, what we call sort of the building blocks of your actual integration. So like the two-way data things in a way, like which data do you want to read from those external APIs and which data do you want to write back? And those we don't pre-build. So we usually build a few examples, but then we don't really pre-build like sort of entire integrations there because that's precisely where we give our customers the control to have full control over integration. So what Nango gives you basically is like this framework that makes it very quick and easy to write your actual business logic that interacts with the external API. And for this, actually, we're using a lot of LLMs these days. So what we figured out is like basically because Nango brings you, gives you all the infrastructure and you really just have to decide sort of kind of like which data do I want to fetch from the external API? What does that look like? And you know, how do I transform it into my worldview? And, and how do I go back from my worldview to the external API? That's something that like LLMs know really well once they know the documentation of the external API. So we either pointed at that, and then we have a you know a GPT for instance that we we fed with with some examples from Nango scripts, and we usually get like 80, 90 percent correct answers. It figures out the endpoints it should be calling. It usually figures out the parameters. It figures out a lot of the data mapping. There's still some editing required, but it makes us at least two to three times more productive when actually building integrations, and we're increasingly you know, giving the same, you know, option, obviously, to our clients. And I think they're finding similar results that, like, they can have something that's custom, basically at the speed almost of pre-built, because thanks to LLMs, it does all the heavy lifting for them of figuring out what to call and how. Sure. I like that a lot because uh, it, it's one of the, I think, red flags that I have for um, dev tools in particular that use LLMs is blindly trusting uh, the output of, of a GPT to be correct. Uh, and I, I like a process that, um, you know, sounds like at least the process that your team is right. doing is like speed up with the LLM, but don't trust it completely. Make sure that it's working correctly and edit, you know, output after the fact. Um, it's a productivity boost in that sense. And I think that's a really important differentiator from like, well, we fed this thing, you know, into an LLM that we have uh, that we've trained on a million things. And like, it's probably right. So you can, you know, go use this to build a bank, right? Like, no, thank you. I'm not interested in that. Um, but But the amount of, I don't know. I don't even know. There might not even be a term for this yet, but like we'll call it LLM skepticism is an important ingredient in uh, building for these things. Um, that, that's cool. How, how long have you been using tools like that for? Yeah, I think like, you know, Copilot came up pretty much with us starting Mango or, or a little bit before. I don't remember the exact timeline, but I think it's like sort of, you know, I think we were using Copilot and, and LLMs to some degree to build, you know, Nango from from day one, right? And so I think it naturally extended to us that, you know, when with the rise of ChatGPT, basically we would start to ask ChatGPT to like, you know, it's great at other coding tasks. Like, why shouldn't it be great at like helping us write, you know, integrations? And I think it's like, you know, you mentioned like you, we don't, we don't see LLMs as kind of like a black box solution, at least not at this stage for building integrations. Um, and I think, you know, our, you know, one of the philosophical principles in a way of Nango is that like we put you, the customer and the engineer who builds the integration into full control, right? Like you always have the last word on what goes out and you can always build whatever you want with the platform. We're just there to make your life easier. And I think, you know, natural LLMs in, in, in deploying them on Nango is a natural extension of that. So, yeah, I think it was always clear to us that like it would be more of a productivity booster. And then eventually if it can do like 99% of the job for you and you kind of just like, oh yeah, that looks great, you know, awesome. But I think the other thing is also with LLMs and, you know, with prompts in general, it's like it's natural language. And like we even as humans, like when we're talking to each other on what we're going to build, have like, you know, misunderstandings of what we were communicating with, like sort of natural language and describing what we want to have built. And so I'm, you know, not sure that like sort of LLMs will ever be able to kind of like read our minds because I think sometimes when we write out what we want, we don't even know yet entirely ourselves. Yeah. So I think it will be interesting to see how that, you know, develops. But it definitely have been a big productivity boost for everybody in our customer base that has been, you know, using them to to build on top of Nango. Sounds like you had really good timing for starting to build the company as well, and in as much as Copilot, you know, sort of started to coexist with you at the same time there too. Can you tell me a little bit about how pricing works for Nango right now? 
Sure. We have a free tier, you know, to get started for like smaller, you know, early stage startups. And then we have like sort of startup friendly, you know, sort of early category, like early pricing so that you, you can really focus on getting to product market fit and like sort of, you know, leverage language for that. And, and we see that people also there iterate a lot. And then, you know, we have basically a scale plan that's really meant for you to scale. One thing that is very important for us is that like, you know, we try to align our our pricing with like sort of the value integrations are driving for your business and, and with sort of the usage that you have on the platform. So we're not big fans of like sort of, you know, prohibiting, I mean, we definitely want to be prohibitively expensive, right? And like sort of, we believe basically we want to power all your integrations, right? We understand that means that like we need to be on the same boat of like, if you're really successful, building a successful business, having a lot of customers use those integrations, like, you know, we should get like a fair share of that success. And, and you know, we should be able to, to cover our costs, but we also believe that, you know, you should be able to have a very profitable business. And I think that's, you know, what, yeah, with integrations, basically, I think that's not always easy because like they are so custom to the product. And so I think a lot of our pricing packages end up reflecting that and end up sort of you know, being really built in collaboration with the customer to figure out like what, you know, makes sense for their business and for their specific use case of integrations. Well, it's really nice to have some flexibility there too. And hopefully when everyone wins, everyone's happier and uh, you're all, you know, building together in the direction towards a future that makes not only their tools better in their company and product, but also your product can continue to support, you know, whatever's coming, um, especially as new versions of the open API sure. spec and all those, those things uh, start to be really no, I think we, we definitely see it as a partnership, right? Like with, with our customers, like it's, you know, integrations are never done. They always keep evolving. They always keep changing. And, you know, as you say, like, you know, the environment keeps changing because you've integrated with third party APIs, those keep changing. And so it's like, yeah, we definitely see it as a, as a long-term partnership more than like, you know, quick, like build it once and then like you're done forever. I think that's the right strategy to have uh, everyone, what's the phrase, um, uh, a rising tide raises all ships or whatever. Uh, the, the old exactly, trope is there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we've talked a little bit about what, what Nango does and um, how teams are adopting it, why teams are adopting it. I'm curious if you can maybe describe what sort of like the typical first experience with Nango is. So it's Hello World uh, when someone first jumps in to give the tools a try. Yeah, good good question. So actually when you sign up for the, for the, for the cloud version of the product, like we immediately have a getting started that lets you connect to GitHub and sync in issues from GitHub so you can see how that works. And then you're actually going to be able to create an issue on a public repo as well. And so like we have like sort of, you know, test repo that, that we use for this. But you'll see basically like what the end user experience flow is going to be. So if a customer goes and authenticates, you know, an integration of your product, like what will they see? Like that experience is fully white label. Like you can customize it entirely. Like we're literally just a JavaScript SDK that you call this nice, you know, I think to to see that for people. And then you get to experience the Nango APIs as well. So you see like how the two-day data syncs work. You see how, you know, how you're going to interact from your app with the platform and like sort of, you know, the flexibility also of this. And I think we see that that's like a, a great way for people to imagine, okay, like, is this going to like work for my use case and start to like sort of architect in their mind on like how will I integrate my integrations here and like how could that work for my product? Yeah, I actually don't think we talked about this early on, but Nango um, supports, uh, is it TypeScript at the moment? Are there other languages that you're supporting or planning to support? Yeah, so like the Nango itself is, is sort of language agnostic. So like, you know, any any backend, you know, language that you use, like is fine. Like we have a REST API for you to interact with it. We have SDKs for various different languages. And then there's a part of the, the integrations itself that you write, they're, they're written in code, they live inside of your Git repo, they're version controlled. You deploy them to Nango with a CLI, and you can think of those as like, you know, very small sort of TypeScript lambdas that just do some interaction with the external API and they run in the context of sort of the Nango frameworks. So those are written in TypeScript, but as I mentioned, you know, they're usually sort of 20 to maybe 50 lines of code, pretty simple TypeScript code. And, and that needs to be TypeScript just because it runs on the platform itself, but the rest is language. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. A, a very interesting developer story. I like that it's... Um... Uh, source controlled as well. Uh, the, the having that sort of history of how the integration plugs itself in is really helpful. I'd imagine when it comes to right. debugging and also reproducing environments and things like that as well. Yeah, exactly. So I think that's a big reason for us, right? Is like sort of a lot of our customers basically will deploy their Nango integrations as part of their CI CD process. So because it's just another like folder in your repo, basically, it follows you know your regular sort of coding deployment flow, whatever you know that might be. The only thing you're going to make sure is like when you deploy to production, you, you have the latest version on Nango and that's as simple as like running a single CLI command. 
Okay, a couple more questions for you, uh, and then then we'll uh, head on our ways here. What are you thinking about next? What are like the problems you're interested in solving, or the the big features you're looking forward to uh, building next with Nango? Yeah, good question. We're building out more on the on the webhook side. Like we have support for webhooks for a lot of the APIs already, but you know, definitely building out more there. I'm very excited about our initiatives to leverage LLMs more to build integrations more quickly on the platform. That I think is something that I'm I'm very excited about, and honestly, but I still see that we still have a lot of potential. And then the other parts is sort of like, I think, you know, one thing that we we already let you customize integrations for individual customers. So what this means is basically like if you cust- if you have a customer that has Salesforce, right? Like I mean, almost every customer customizes their Salesforce. And so we see that like sort of those differences in Salesforce can make it tricky to build integrations against those kind of, you know, more complex systems. We have some helpers already there for you today, but like we have a couple of good ideas on like how we can make that a lot less painful in the future. And that's something I'm really excited about because I think the world of SaaS is in a way moving more and more towards customization and more complex systems. As like everybody has all of their data and software, they want their software to be more flexible to really fit their needs. And so I think we're going to see much more customizability of different you know systems and APIs in the future. And so I think supporting our customers in supporting their customers, you know, with this, I think is a is an important part of our mission. Yeah, and again, that's another great place where you can grow together and and sort of hopefully support features that help your your customers exactly. do better too. Super cool. Robin, Absolutely. what about uh, your team right now? Are you currently hiring? Yeah, we're always growing. We have just had a you know good growth spurt, but we're always looking for you know talented people, especially on the back end engineering side. If you're you know excited about APIs, maybe have experience building integrations, would love to build an open source dev tool for other developers. We'd you know love to hear from you. What's the URL? Where can people go to find Nango? Sure, that's www.nango.dev or just Google Nango. That's like Mango with an N, and you're gonna find us. Cool. Uh, I'll make sure I have some links in the show notes as well, both to your website and your uh, repos on GitHub. Uh, And one last question for you, Robin, where's the best place to find you online if people want to shout about integrations and uh, APIs for for integrating and things like that? Where are you most active? Um, You can always find me on LinkedIn. Uh, If you look for Robin Nango, uh, you'll find me there. You know, when you send me a, a connection request, maybe, you know, call out the show here. Um, that I know you know where you're coming from and I'll be happy to accept and you know we can message there. Otherwise, I'm also active on the Nango Slack community. If you are looking into Nango, you're probably going to end up there and I'm always active there. Wonderful. Well, Robin, thanks so much for joining today. It's been uh, really interesting to talk to you and, and to hear about Nango and how you got to where you're at. Um, feel free to come back anytime if you've, you've got launches in the works and things like that. We'd love to hear from you again. Thanks so much for joining. It's been a pleasure. Thanks a lot for having me, Mike. Right on. Take care.